Since the very first use of airplanes in war, military planners have looked for ways to make aircraft more effective and more lethal. Once so secret their very existence was denied by the government, unmanned air combat vehicles, or UCAVs, are now poised to take the preeminent role in 21st century air combat. UAVs are certainly going to change air power in the 21st century. You can see it starting to happen today, but what we're looking at now is just the beginning because there's going to be more of them and they're going to be better. Unmanned aerial vehicles allow the military to do more with less, to put more aircraft into the air than you otherwise would be able to because of the limited number of pilots that you might have or where it might be too risky. In the future, aircraft that have no pilots on board will carry out the most dangerous combat missions. Today, unmanned air vehicles, or UAVs, are already taking over the role of long-duration surveillance. UAVs don't have mothers. You lose a UAV in combat and nobody bats an eyelid. One of the earliest surveillance UAVs was the Predator. It was developed in the early 1990s. When you look at Predator, basically they start off as being long endurance systems that can really persist over the battlefield. In Afghanistan, Predators provided critical real-time intelligence. And it was there that a Predator made an amazing transformation from surveillance to armed aerial attack. The fire to help our missile an Al-Qaeda convoy and destroyed one of the vehicles in there. And at that point, it crossed the line from an unmanned aerial vehicle into an unmanned combat aerial vehicle. Today, the new Predator B can carry up to 10 Hellfire missiles. Of course, its primary mission is still what the military refers to as ISR, or Information, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. It's basically a poor man's satellite. I mean, you can bring it in and, uh, and, and let it dwell in an area. UAVs transmit important visual information to battlefield commanders via satellite or other data links. Once targets had been located, identified, and cataloged, these could be disseminated to other weapons or weapon systems. Reconnaissance UAVs have multiple ways of conducting surveillance. On clear days, they use specially stabilized optical lenses that can zoom to high magnification. At night, they use infrared, and under adverse conditions, they use synthetic aperture radar to pierce the thickest clouds, sandstorms, or oil field smoke. When the radar is reflected back, it can also be used to create a 3D image of objects. If the enemy chooses to use countermeasures or decoys or deception techniques, Having to beat three systems is a lot harder than one. The success of the Predator paved the way for the development of an even more advanced high-altitude jet-powered UAV by Northrop Grumman. It's called the Global Hawk, but unlike the Predator, it was designed to take off, fly its pre-programmed mission, and land all on its own, thanks to the GPS, or Global Positioning Satellite System. The Global Hawk is basically a much larger version of the Predator. It has higher altitude capabilities, increased payload. It can carry a lot more sensors, a lot more communication devices, and it can loiter over a battlefield for up to 35 hours. The Global Hawk can stay aloft for a day or more, providing constant near real-time video surveillance over an area the size of Illinois. Predator and Global Hawk give us an up-close view which is something you can't get from a national asset, which would be a satellite type of thing. Though still in development, the Global Hawk had a dramatic impact during Operation Iraqi Freedom. A single prototype provided information to Allied forces on 55% of all time-sensitive targets, including mobile Scud missile launchers. Like the Air Force, the Navy wanted its own autonomous UAVs. However, designing one to take off and land on an aircraft carrier was a tremendous challenge. But the engineers at Northrop Grumman were up for it. In the summer of 2000, they began working on the X-47 Pegasus. 
The hardest part of the Pegasus program was definitely the flight controls. Uh, getting on and off an aircraft carrier, of course, is one of the toughest design problems for an aircraft. And doing this with a tailless vehicle like Pegasus certainly was the toughest problem we had. That problem was solved by using six innovative surfaces to make the plane climb, descend, and turn. This surface just rotates up. The yellow bond, of course, both up and down. And then there's another inlay on the lower surface as well. The first flight of uh, Pegasus, the demonstration, was uh, very, very successful. It lasted approximately 12 minutes. There was no human in the loop. But could Pegasus, without any human assistance, land within the tiny space between the arresting cables of an aircraft carrier? The engineers came up with an ingenious way to find out. And we actually glued a small paintball down under the bottom of the hook so we could get a clear touchdown point. That was quite an achievement that we're very proud of. The Navy will use its stealthy UAVs to get targeting information for its guns, missiles, and fighter aircraft. The initial focus has been on information surveillance and reconnaissance to provide targeting information to the Navy's strike packages. But many future UAVs, such as Boeing's X-45 unmanned bomber, will be heavily armed. Although flying pre-programmed missions, armed UAVs will still need human permission to fire. It has to know where friendly forces are on the ground, where civilians might be, where collateral damage, i.e. hitting a church or a mosque, might be an issue. So there is an element that we always retain where a human in the loop is important. You can have a weapon that's doing its own surveillance and has its own ability to engage a target, and that gives you a level of dominance that uh, we're just emerging on right now.